Okay, so today we're talking about information gathering. So this is the very important first step that an attacker takes when they're trying to figure out how to break into a system. So, you know, so far in this module, you've actually already done a few attacks. Uh, so last week's lab involved um, actually exploiting a different Samba vulnerability than the one that we just discussed. Um, but a legitimate question that you might be asking yourself while you're doing that vulnerabilities lab is, yeah, but how do I know what basically what, what's vulnerable? How do I know which steps to take? How do I know what vulnerabilities are available to exploit on the system? And now here's the answer to that question. So these are the things that you do to gather information about a system so that you know enough to attack it. So, you know, the, the old um, quote, give me six hours to chop down a tree and I'll spend the first four sharpening the axe, so that's Abraham Lincoln. Um, basically, the point is most of the time will be spent doing information gathering. So when you're attacking a system, you're probably the majority of your time is doing that preparation to figure out what's likely to work um, so that you are prepared for what you're actually going to do. And the exploitation is possibly one of the most exciting steps, um, but it's usually the shortest. And then post-exploitation, again, has uh, could take a while depending on what you're trying to do. So that's what you do after you gain access to the to the system. So it's basically we can break down it into three sections when you're attacking a, a system. So usually an attack's going to start with information gathering. And the more information that the attacker has, the more likely they're actually going to be successful. They're not just guessing um, what, what they're going to do to try and attack the system. So what kinds of information might be helpful to an attacker? Yes, IP address ranges. So if you know uh, what IP addresses they're likely to use, then that is a very, very good first step if you're attacking system. Operating systems. Operating systems, yeah. So if you don't know what operating systems they're run, running, then it's going to be harder to, to actually attack the system. Yes. Anything else? This software they might be running. Yes. So knowing what software is there, what services they're providing is a critical piece of information in order to attack that system. So um, also you might be looking at like social engineering side of things. So you might be looking at things like, um, you know, job postings and things like that to find out, you know, names of managers. That'll also tell you that possibly what software they're using. Um, but yeah, detecting network ranges is very important. So then you know what targets that um, you, you have. Um, identifying basically all attack surface. So everything that you can interact with is potential attack surface. So, um, so the term, term attack surface is just everything that you have available that you can talk to. So if, you, um, as, if you're defending a system, if you minimize the attack surface, so you minimize the stuff that's exposed to the internet, then that is good for security. Um, but if you're an attacker, it's important to just basically identify everything that you could possibly try to attack. And that could include people you could talk to to try and do some social engineering. But um, you know, the thing that we're focusing on here are things like what services are available. So we want to know what, um, you know, what software is running on that computer and as much as possible about that software. So we might know that, oh, this looks like an Apache server, for example. It helps us more if we know the exact version of Apache that's running. So we do everything that we can to find out about what's on the system so that we can uh, have a good chance of knowing the sorts of attacks that will work. Um, and also, like on the website side of things, like what AP, you know, is there like a RESTful API that's there? Like, <clears throat> you know, what, what websites are there? What input? do they allow? Basically figuring out everything that we have to work with um, and just starting to query those services to find out what information is there. So we might be able to um, talk to a, SAM, to a Samba or a um, SMB, like Windows Server or something, and try and figure out you know, what usernames are allowed on that system and what directories are actually there and things like that. So there's two sides of this. There's a passive and then there's active techniques. So passive is basically when you don't directly interact with their systems um, at all. Um, and in that case, there's nothing that, the, that, that they can do to even detect that there's anything happening. 
So for example, if you just go onto Google and you type something in and you look at Google's cache and all that sort of stuff, none of that will ever touch the server of the people you're attacking. I mean, Google will have some record somewhere that this that your IP address was asking for that stuff. But the company, the organization themselves, there's, there's absolutely no way they can know that you're even doing that at all. Uh, also, if you have physical access to a network, you can basically plug in and then just sit there and listen to the network traffic. And depending on where you're connected to the network, you might may or may not get anything interesting. But if you manage to walk up to a switch and it has, um, but basically some switches have like a port that has all of the traffic that is on that switch flows through that port. You can plug into that, then you now can listen in on everything on that network. It could be um, the finger to listen. Sorry? You know, like most of the companies now you go to, uh, they have the telephone suckers for ISO IP. Yeah. You could change them actually to a hub or to a normal one. Yeah, so sometimes, yeah, you, sometimes you'll be able to connect in, in an office, you better connect into a network, but that will only give you access to that network segment. So depending on where you connect in, you'll, have a, you'll be able to listen in on different computers, basically. So, um, so yeah, but that can be a passive attack where you, uh, your computer, um, I mean, you can do it in a way that doesn't actually interact with the network at all. It's just receiving information. So again, there's nothing they can really do to detect that's happened. Um, or if there is, it's very hard to detect that that's happening. Um, and then there's active information gathering where you're actually interacting with the target systems. But again, it's often really hard to detect or it happens so often that no one would ever investigate it. So something like running a port scan against a computer on the internet. You, you, if you're running a web server, you can't go and investigate every port scan that happens on your system because it just happens so frequently that you know basically you don't care essentially. So a lot of scanning stuff will just go under the radar and no one will, will even really notice that you're doing it basically. Um, but with active information gathering, there is they can if they care they can see that something's happening. So you start interacting with their computers and making requests and trying to figure out as much as you can about their computer. So <clears throat> you can break down steps of information gathering into three steps broadly. So there's footprinting, so that's mostly passive. It's finding things like network ranges and um, it might include some things like information gathering um, to do with open source intelligence, nothing to do with open source software. Open source intelligence is about things like stuff that's in publicly available on the internet. Uh, so looking at job adver adverts and stuff like that. So then once you have all that information, you go into scanning, which is an active phase where you're actually identifying each of the actual live IP addresses. You start off with a range. So for example, you might know Leeds Beckett University have this IP address range. Okay, that's good, but you, the next step is figure out which IP addresses are actually used in that range and exposed to the internet and you know that we have to talk to if we were going to attack. So you can basically look for um, IP addresses that are live and what for ports and services are available being provided across the internet. And then you've got an enumeration stage which is often tied into the scanning phase because the same software often does the enumeration stuff as well. But basically that's where you start querying the services for more information. <clears throat> so an IP address, um, just really basic networking reminder for you guys is is it's basic. It's obviously it's a it's a number that that identifies a computer on the network. So for example, um, you know the example on screen one six zero nine point two four four point five eight is an IP address, and all communications over the internet protocol, which is the main protocol that communications happen um, on the internet, basically. Um, so TCP and UDP are both based on um, the internet protocol. Um, use that IP address to route information from your, com you know, across the internet, basically, across, um, make its way from one computer to another. So it's really important to know IP addresses so that we can actually start an attack. Um, and if we can get a list of all the IP addresses of systems that are on the organization's network, then that will help us a lot. Um, and particularly if there are IP addresses that are exposed to the internet, because there might be like prop, um, like LAN IP addresses where they, they're only accessible to um, 
the internal network, and then there'll be some IP addresses that are actually available, but you know, directly from the internet. So, but it's all can be useful information because, um, as we'll talk about later in the semester, when you basically break into one computer that's internet facing, from there you can start attacking all their internal computers. So at that point, you want to know the IP addresses of the, you know, the internal IP addresses. So domain name system. Um, so just to get a feel for the class, how many is it, is this a um, revision for you guys? Just a show of hands if you know what I'm talking about. Okay, yeah. So um, so just briefly then, the um, DNS is used to resolve a name. So when you type in Google dot co.uk, um, your web browser it can't actually do anything helpful with that without using DNS to basically um, convert that name into the IP address. And then the IP address is used to actually talk to Google. So the, the name is just like um, a means to an end, uh, just because it, you know, it's easy for us. But DNS as a system is hierarchical, so we've got uh, basically a tree of um, databases basically. So for example, if you search for library.leadsbecker.co.uk, um, that we would have our own I, uh, DNS server that will tell you what the IP address is for library. Okay. Um, and the the IP address for Leeds Becker will be, you know, on one of the map, you know, yeah, it, it'll, it'll, the, it'll be in a DNS server that is um, managed by someone else. So it's, it's a hierarchy. <clears throat> but the easy way to think about this is it's like a um, address book. So if you um, had a phone, a phone book and you wanted to basically call um, a certain, I don't know, fish and chip store or whatever, you're not likely to remember the number unless you call them really often. And <laughs> nowadays, Ever, we all use mobile phones, so I, I don't know. I haven't remembered a phone number in ages, anyway. But um, because we've got address books in our mobile phones, but back in the olden days, you had to actually look up the number and type it into something, and then they would call it. Um, and um, that's easier than having to remember all the numbers, and that's exactly what DNS does with domain names. So you know, looks up Amazon.co.uk so that we don't have to memorize the IP address and type it in. So there are some commands uh, that you can use on uh, Unix systems to look up information about DNS um, records. So you can use the dig command. So the first example on the slide there is dig plus short and then a URL. And that will just come back with the IP addresses. So that's the, the simplest version. So that'll just res respond with IP addresses that um, and you know there might be a few, uh, and they'll, they'll all provide the same website. So that there might be multiple servers or um, some basically some redundancy. Um, in, uh, other times it'll just return a single IP address. If you just type dig leads um, leads Becker or leads Matt on the slides there dot ac dot uk, it'll actually return back um, a whole bunch of other information as well. So not only um, the A records, so you can see here um, A records, um, so you can see that they, um, they're those IP addresses that are up there. And um, there's also some other records that we'll talk about in a minute. Um, so, but that's not everything either. So you can also um, get more out of dig by using other commands and um, we will, uh, you'll look at that in the lab, and I'll mention some of those in a minute as well. Uh, some other commands are NS lookup and host, and they all basically do the same thing. They're just ways of querying DNS servers. NS lookup, uh, I guess, is the most confusing because there's a Unix version and a Windows version, but they're not the same. Uh, they're similar, so um, if you learn it, and then you, it just makes things more confusing, I guess. But, um, but yeah, there's that. Um, reverse lookup is when you start with an IP address and try and figure out the name. Um, so if you have an IP address, you can do, um, you know, in this case, you're using dig, dig plus short um, dash x, 
and then an IP address, and it will return back with the um, the server that's hosted on that IP address or the, the name that resolves to that IP address. Can anyone think of an example when that might come in handy for a security professional? <coughs> Yes, so you, so the example you're giving is you're attacking a system, but you don't know what server it is, and you want to know. Uh, yes, that that could be an example. Although, yes, that's true. Any other examples? Being attacked. Yeah. Yeah. So if you've been attacked and you've got an IP address in your logs, this can actually um, tell you about some information about the. Um, who owns that IP address? So it might be if they're stupid enough not to use a, like a VPN or Tor or anything like that, a proxy or something. It might be their ISP will show up when you do, when you look this up, and then you might um, you know you can take that further and try and get the ISP to reveal to you who um, who had that IP address at, at that time, um, which might re might require getting. Um, some uh, law enforcement involved. So um, DNS record types. So I mentioned before, there's A records, which are the just the standard IP addresses. That's IPv4. The AAAA quadruple A records are the IPv6, which is um, obviously basically the exact same thing as what we're talking about with IP addresses, but that it's a longer number so that it's more future proof because we basically we've run out of IPv4 addresses and it's as long as I can remember, people have been worried about us running out, and it's happened, and we're still using IPv4. But go figure. Well, I think it's because of subnetting now they're able to use. Uh, they were still with a long time ago. So. Yeah, yeah. So we've got subnetting now, which meant, yeah, it's, you're right. It means we've been able to draw it out a bit longer, uh, and we use things like NAT so that we can basically, when your home computer. All of your computers at home basically share the same IP address, which is your um, home router. Um, but that's not actually the way the internet was originally designed. Um, but it's just a clever workaround so that we can have less IP addresses. But with IPv6, that kind of solves the problem in in some ways because there are, I think, the, the, there's like a, enough I, more IP addresses than there are grains of sand on the earth or something. There's like enough for everyone to have an IP address. You give your light globe an IP, IP addresses. There's loads. Um, so there's, there's these other records as well. So just briefly, C name is an alias of a name to another DNS record. An M MX record is a mail server. So for example, if you um, did a DNS lookup against um, Leeds Beckett and there's an NS record, uh, sorry, um, MX record, then that would be the um, the email server, the, the IP address of the, the server that provides email for Leeds Beckett. Um, NS records are the actual name servers, so um, so the, the server that can provide more details about DNS records for that organization. And then there's the SOA, which is the authoritative information about DNS zone. Um, which is where you can get information about things like what is the, the, net, the name server and who the admin email and things like that. So uh, DNS zone transfer is when uh, one DNS server talks to another and says, tell me everything you know. And it basically dumps the entire database, so all of the records from that DNS server and tells it to the other DNS server, here you go, here's everything I know, and you know, do what you will with it. Um, it's one of the older but still used methods um, between DNS servers so that name servers can retrieve information from one another. Um, and the, basically the way it works, the secondary name server would send an uh, um, AXFR type request. So you know we were talking about A requests quadruple A, this is a different type of request you can make. Um, and if it allows a zone transfer, the DNS server will respond with everything that it knows. Um, it should only ever be allowed to specific systems. Um, but it can be a security misconfiguration. And um, I guess just to illustrate that it can still happen, in the labs, in this week's lab, you may have already done a zone transfer. 
against um, the DNS server that we've got set up in the lab. True story, that wasn't intentionally set up that way. Um, that was an accident. Someone <coughs> misconfigured the DNS server. And as a result, we can demonstrate that within the labs and actually look up all that information. Um, so it can still happen, um, but it, it shouldn't, basically. If you do a, try and do this against um, Google, um, then it will respond back with basically nothing. It'll just say, we, you know, not allowed kind of thing. Um, because, the, I mean, the really bad thing about it is because it leaks the names of servers. So, for example, if we have um, if if we had our main DNS server for Leeds Beckett had this vulnerability, so someone had misconfigured it that way, and we asked for it, then the attacker would basically just be given all the information on server part. Of, these are all the names of all the servers, not and all the IP addresses, and that gives you a detailed information about attack service and saves you a lot of time of having to do any scanning or anything like that, and knowing the name of the system is actually quite helpful as well. So it shouldn't happen anymore, but unfortunately it still does sometimes. So who is, is um, when you register, how many, got, how many of you here have owner domain name? 10. 10 domain names, good. Um, yeah, so a few of you. Um, so when you registered your domain name, so if you've registered, um, aneve.com or whatever, um, then you will have had to basically go through a, a registrar to do that. And um, you need to provide your contact details, including your address, your phone number, email address. Um, and all of that information is stored in a public database, um, which I'll get to in a second. Um, so if you use the Whois database, you can get to all this information. And Whois is a protocol, a program, and also a directory. So just to keep things interesting, the main the name means a few things, which I'll talk about. So, okay, so I will also mention that often these services you will charge you money to keep your details private so that their name goes on the record instead of yours. Um, and it's ridiculous to be, to, to be honest, like that, you know. So you can pay them money to keep your information private. That's good though. Like my com I've got all my, my two companies both are just on the home address. I don't want my personal details going to people. Yeah, but if you own ten domain names, how much money is it costing you for them to keep that information private? You pay for each of these. Per domain. Yeah. So so yeah. So you're paying yeah, like fifty pounds just for them not to be publishing your information. So um Regional internet registries um, are responsible for keeping a record of all, all this stuff. So the registers feed, um, registrars feed all this information through to these databases. Uh, and there are different databases for different sections of the world. So, um, you know, so we are, uh, is this working? Yeah, I can't really see it. Uh, so we're in the right zone. But there's like all these different areas around the world. And if you look at the Whois um, program, it can basically um, tell you what sources it's using, like what are the databases that it's using. So you can use that command there. So as I mentioned before, Whois is a program. So if you're using a, a um, Unix system, you can just type in on the command line Whois and then the name um, of a URL. And it will um, feed back all the. It'll it'll figure out what server it needs to connect to to find out the information, and it'll feed all that. Um, it uses TCP port 43, and for that reason, we can't demonstrate. We can't do that in the labs because all of our internet traffic goes via a proxy. So um, we can't use the program directly. Um, but there are loads of websites that provide access to the Whois database, and it's basically exactly the same except that you type the. Um, the name into the into the database website, and it will look up the information and give it to you. Um, so you can also use it to tell us who an IP address belongs to, um, and the the block or range of an IP address um, is also owned by the same company. So in this example here at the bottom, you can basically say who is this IP address. And it will tell you who, who owns that IP address. 
And um, the in this example, there's two different companies listed, and one is a subset of the other. So it looks like <coughs> the top one is like a company that's like has a whole range of IP addresses, and then the Free Software Foundation has um, basically a subset of that. So IP addresses are typically signed in blocks. Um, you can also, if you look up based on uh, an IP address, you can find all sorts of interesting information, um, such as, so you, you only know the IP address, but from that you can find out, for example, um, you know what the range is of IP addresses that that company owns. So we, we only need one single IP address to find the range that that organization that owns. Um, and also all sorts of like private information, well, public information that could be useful to an attacker. So um, who is on record as being the person that you contact if you've got questions about this stuff? So in, in, in this example, we've got a few names here that we might be able to use if we were trying to do some kind of social engineering attack. Um, Just yes. a question of good uh, uh, who put these regulations in for this course, like you know, that it has to be all available to public? Is there an organization? Um, I can, I think, is the answer to that question. I so, who, who overlooks all this stuff? It's, I think, um, it's ICAN, which is a, um, so ICAN, which is a US. Thing, which is has raised a few questions in the past. The fact that basically um, the the internet is overseen by the U.S., but um, they basically decide all of these things, and they, they kind of provide some regulatory over, oversight. But the internet is designed originally to be like a free plat free and open platform. Um, so, you know, there, there are usually when these sorts of decisions are made, they have like committees and things and lots of people involved in the decision making process. And it's not just one person that makes a decision. So, um, so yeah, and this continues off screen. There's lots of information there. So subdomains is a um, domain larger, part of a larger domain. So I already mentioned library.leadsbecker earlier, um, which is part of Leadsbecker, which is part of UK. Uh, AC.UK, uh, and so on. So each of these has a different IP address. So library.leadsbecker will typically have a different IP address to Leadsbecker itself. So if we can find um, subdomains, that can also help us find servers that might be of interest to try and break into, basically. So we can do something called brute forcing, which is where we basically just guess and look for hits. So we can brute force subdomains by guessing ones that are likely to happen. So library is a uh, is pretty easy to guess, right? I think most universities would have library dot the university name, but also we can try all the words in the English language, maybe other languages if it's like appropriate for who you're trying to attack. Um, and there's, you know, you might look for like mail dot leadsbecker or outlook dot leadsbecker and things like that. Um, so there are tools you can use like DNS map that does that for you so they can actually try these things. And there are other tools like Fierce, DNS and Um, DNS Recon that will do basically everything that we've been talking about and try and automate all this process to try and search out all this information from, from an organization. So scanning is the next phase. So we've managed to find out all the IP addresses. We've got some information in, in interesting information about the organization. Next stage is um, an active stage where we try and identify the IP addresses, ports, and services. So if you're a network administrator, you might use all these same techniques to just keep a, um, a record of what's going on in your organization. Check no one has just like installed another server on your um, network that they're not supposed to. It doesn't hurt to check these things every now and then. Um, but for an attacker, it helps to um, basically plan your attacks so you can see what's there. So it reveals the attack surface in even more detail. So all the various things exposed to the attacker that they can try to compromise. So once an attacker knows an IP address with an open port and what version of software it has, then they can start looking at um, exploits that, that will work against that specific setup. Um, or you know, a more advanced attacker might actually start looking for new attacks against that system.
So Nmap um, is an open source tool for network exploration, security auditing. Uh, I guess you can read that yourself, but that's from the man page. Um, and um, Nmap is the most popular and one of the most powerful port scanners um, and scanners in general that exists. Um, so if you are doing any network administration on a, on a, on a system, Nmap is going to be your go-to tool for finding what systems are on, on your network and things like that. But also very helpful for an attacker. Is it Nmap or Zenmap, which is for both Windows and Linux? Nmap is available for both. Um, there are loads of port scanners, like more than I care to mention, but I will mention another scanner at the end, which is worth knowing about. So, um, ping sweep. Um, does anyone here know what a ping ping is? Yeah, someone want to tell me? How you're gonna is you send a map request and how you get a map request is when it's going to the domain, like you know, you type it, google.com, that when it's sending the app request, uh, it's basically pinging it, saying that I'm live, I'm active. Uh, sort of. of the the app request is like at a is is, is at a different level. Yeah. Yeah. It's a communication as a message. Yes. Yeah. Yes. It's, 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 it's an it's like yes. telnet, it's like an a, a kind of internet. Sort of. Communication yes, so it, it's it's ICMP. It's basically a special kind of um, packet that you send to a computer to ask it whether it's alive. But and it's that simple. And there's these other layer. You know, ARP is used to to basically um, you know give you a MAC address and all that sort of stuff. But the, but ICMP is basically just a request that gets sent across the the internet or across the network to ask, are you there? And the server will. Um, Possibly respond with yes, I'm here, all's fine. Um, so yeah, so it sends uh, an echo request. Most hosts will require with a, an uh, will reply with an echo response. Um, so ping suite basically sends out echo requests to every possible IP address and see which ones reply back. Um, and if you use Nmap, the default is to do that when you are. Uh, so if you do um, Nmap minus SN, so that's basically doing um, host discovery and then an IP address or an IP address range in this example um, is basically going to try doing the, the ping request. It's also going to try some other tricks that are, that are listed there. So TCP SYN to port 443, TCP ACK to port 80 and a timestamp request. So the reason that it does a few things is um, to try and figure out whether that computer is alive is some people set up their firewalls to disable um, ping responses going through. Um, and there are arguments for and against that. Um, so it doesn't actually provide much extra security. It does make it a bit harder to troubleshoot things. And it does make it slightly harder for an attacker to discover a system. So there's arguments on either side. But um, if you do these tricks, you're more likely to find it. So this, that last one there, the timestamp request, is interesting because people forget that ICMP have more than just the standard ping um, echo request and response. So they often, if they set up a firewall, they'll say, oh, block ping. But actually, you can still just ask for a timestamp request, and they'll still respond back to that. So if there aren't any routers involved and you're running as root, so if you do the sudo first, uh, it'll even tell you the MAC address if you're on it. So if there's no routers, so you're on a local area network, um, it'll tell you the MAC addresses as well. And that can tell you some interesting stuff too, because um, the first three octets of a MAC address is the um, brand that create, um, produced the uh, network card. So that will tell you something. So it will often tell you if it's a virtual machine because it will come up with like VMware or something. Um, but also if you say it's a Hewlett Packard, then that gives you some ideas about it. If it's Cisco, then you know it's probably like a switch or a router or like some kind of network gear. So that can be helpful information as well. So the next step is looking for open ports. Um, and basically everything on, on an instant, all the communications that happen uh, typically are over a port. 
And the port numbers are just used. So again, for some of you, this will be like really revision, but for others, this might be new information. So a port number is when you are connecting from one computer to another over the, over for, for anything. The port numbers let the computers know which programs are talking to each other. So a program will be listening on port 80, which is yeah, HTTP, so web server. And then if you connect to a server, server and say, give me port 80, then if there is a web server running on it, that's what you connect to. So that's what port numbers are for. So here are some important port numbers that you do need to remember. Um, so the, the these will be in the test. So client um, server is the way that most connections happen. So you've got a web server that listens on a port. Client connects to that remote port. So um, the client then start client and server start this conversation. And in this case, the client starts by saying, "Give me a website," and the server will respond with one or an error, or or respond with an error message. So that's how. Uh, that communication happens. So a port scan can involve connecting to every single one of the 65,535 possible ports. So that's how many ports there are um, possible on a computer. If it succeeds in connecting, then we know the port's open. If it doesn't succeed, then it's closed or it's filtered or there's a firewall. Right, so, 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 so it's either it's either closed or there's something stopping us from connecting to it. So, if we break it down even further as to the exact stuff that gets flown over the network when we first connect to a computer, this is what happens. So this is at a lower level, um, where when a um, client connects to a server, the very first packet that gets sent over the network includes a flag that says SYN. And then the server responds with synac, which means, yes, good to go. And the client says ack. And at that point, we now have a TCP connection. So we can start communicating. And then all that stuff that I just discussed would happen. Um, but if you think about this, in order to know that there's a port open, how many of these steps do we need to do? Just the first one. So the client sends a SYN packet and then, oh yeah, port's open. No? First two. First two, yeah. So we send the first one and we have to wait for a response, right? But if the server responds out with SYNAC and says, yeah, good to go, at that point, we don't even need to connect to know that the port's open. So that's what a SYN scan is, is it basically just skips connecting. And it means it can go a lot faster because it's just sending out requests, listening back. It doesn't need to keep track of anything really. Uh, it doesn't need to remember which, um, you know, that it's waiting for a response or anything like that. It just, oh, we've got a response. Yeah, the port's open. Um, on a Linux system, you need root access to do this um, because you need to write to the network directly rather than using other like, standard interfaces. Um, if you are doing a port scan um, on um, with Nmap, it's simply this Nmap dash SS, capital S, um, and then the IP address or the host name, and that will do a SYN scan. Um, and in this case, it's responding back. So it will, by default, scan a about a 1,000 ports. It doesn't do every single one. It'll choose ones that are likely to hit. If you want it to do every single one, you need to tell it to. Um, but here, you can see it's responding back with two open ports. We can see port 80 is open and port 443, which are both web servers. Uh, so this is Google, obviously, have uh, their, their server running. So um, knowing the ports there tells us there's something there. But in order to know what we can do to try and attack it, we want to know what is running on it. So if it's a web server, is it IIS or is it Apache or something else? What version is running? So the way that we could do that is banner grabbing, which is the simplest version of this, where we just connect to a port and see what it sends. So here you can do NC, like netcat, and then the, uh, um, host and a port. And in this case, it responds back saying it's an FTP server with the exact version. Um, some servers will re report the service version, like the, the version and everything. 
but it might not be reliable. And I'll answer the question why because we're running out of time. But um, it could be lying, basically. So there's software that can um, try and take that further to figure out whether exactly what version of software it is, not necessarily trusting what it's saying about itself. So AMAP was one of the first versions of this, and it's kind of like it's not really maintained anymore. But NMAP does this really well. So if you do NMAP um, dash S capital V, it will do this server identification. And it can also do OS identification because different operating systems have different network stacks, so different code for their networking, and therefore will act in slightly different ways. And by analyzing the way that it's responding and using the internet, you can figure out what operating system is. So is it Linux or is it Windows and so on? And um, you mentioned ZMAP earlier. Um, ZMAP is something that's very quite recent. I think it was about two years ago that it was released. And the amazing thing about ZMAP is you can do a complete scan of the entire internet, the entire IPv4 internet in under 45 minutes. So you can scan on a specific port and find every single web server on the internet in, in under 45 minutes. Um, the way it does that is it doesn't try and track any connections. It just basically just sprays it all out there and sees what happens. Um, it'll just use one port and it does SIN scan. Um, and you can combine it with a banner grubber to get extra information from those servers. So in conclusion, um, at this point, we now know the organizational information. We've got IP addresses, we've got subdomains, we've got open ports. We know what version of software is running. We know what operating systems are in use. We basically know everything we need in order to attack the system, which we will cover next week. So thank you, guys. Uh, see you then.